Can you guys hear me? I'm not sure if this is on. For me, it just sounds the same. All righty. So today, very special day. When you think about civil engineering, there's a rite of passage, if you will. I know you guys are all excited to get your iron rings. That's a rite of passage. Today, we are going to take the rite of passage continuum mechanic and start talking about strain tensors. The whole beginning of this course, it was basically just linear algebra. We didn't really do any continuum mechanics. We focused on the background so that when we start talking about the actual theory, which we're going to be doing today, hopefully it makes a lot of sense. <laughs> At least that's, that's my goal. So today we're going to start talking about strain. It might be a little bit overwhelming because the derivations, well, some of them aren't very pretty. It's going to be the same thing for stress. It's going to be the same thing for constitutive laws. The derivations, not pretty. I will never test you guys on the derivations. I'll test you guys on the final formulas that we get, but I'll never test you guys on the derivations. So I want to make that clear so no one's really scared. Uh, a couple announcements before we begin. I sent out an email. I extended assignment two by basically the weekend. Uh, if it helps you, great. If not, then I guess who, who cares? Uh, it's just to help in case you guys had some problems last week with the craziness. Also, I was assigned an office. I think it's 361 in base. Uh, I'm usually there from after the lecture until the seminar starts. So if you guys want to come show up and talk, I'll be there most of the time. Uh, today, I might not be because I have to go get the art card. <laughs> uh, who has gotten it? Perfect. Where do I get it? <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> Sub-basement. Okay, so it's almost similar to the UPS. All right, sounds good. So I have to go do that, and then after I'll be back up in the office, so if you guys need anything. Another thing, too, is I know that office hours don't always work with your schedule, so if you guys need to set up a meeting, just email me. We can set it up in person, online, whatever. I'm always here if you guys need it, OK? I want to make that clear. Is there any questions before we get into strain? We're going to go nice and slow through it, so hopefully you guys understand and digest it very well. But any questions before we do that? No? Everybody still happy? Perfect. All right, I'm going to try to unplug and replug this in one more time. To see if it goes to the large screen. I'm getting no luck. <laughs> I don't know why. Sometimes it just pops during the lecture. What happens if I go to the notes? See that now it goes large. All right, back to PowerPoint. Oops. Ah, I found the secret. Okay, so before we begin, one last thing I want to say the concepts we're going to start talking about now are not going to be on the first midterm. The first midterm was purely that linear algebra review. Starting today, all this stuff will be the focus of the second midterm. Okay? The second midterm is not cumulative, so I won't specifically be testing you guys on linear algebra. But as you guys are going to see, we're dealing with tensors. That mathematical knowledge that we've talked about, you're going to need indirectly for the second midterm. So hopefully that makes sense. All right, so let's begin. This is where things get fun. Actually, before I begin, I want to ask you guys a very simple question, because not a lot of engineers really figure this out. When we talk about strain, our main idea is to figure out displacements. If I know strains, I can find displacements. And when we think about structural design, I said that there's two aspects. We have a strength component, make sure that our material resistance is higher than our loads. And then we have a serviceability component. Make sure our structure doesn't feel like garbage. Make sure that it's stiff enough so that when I'm walking across the floor, it's not deflecting up and down, stuff like that. So we can see that deflection plays a big role in the serviceability side, vibration, stuff like that. But does it play a role on the strength side? What do you guys think? If I'm comparing the loads placed on my building, let's say from wind, something like that, to the material strength of my building, does deflection play a role? Who thinks yes? All right, couple. Who thinks no? Interesting. 
The secret is it does. Structural design, if we don't consider deflection, is very simple. Very simple. It's once we start talking about deflection that things get crazy. And let's actually go through kind of a quick example of something fun. All right, let me switch the page color so I don't blind you. What I'm going to do is we are just going to look at a column that's fixed at the bottom. Okay, just a column, cantilever column. Columns usually have two loads. One, of course, is going to be an axial load, P. Makes sense, it's a column. And then once the floor slab above it moves, there's going to be a lateral load, L. Very typical for a column. Now, if I wanted the moment at the base of this column, and we know that the column has a height of, let's say, h, what's my moment going to be equal to? L times h. Now my question for you guys is, what is that lateral load going to do to my column? It's going to deflect it. So now, we'll go to the green scenario. My column looks something like this. Because it is now deflected due to L. Now does that P create a moment? Yes. And is that moment going to deflect my column even further? So is the moment going to change again? And then since the deflection change, is the moment going to change again? It's called second order effects. And this is what makes structural design a bitch. Because as we can see, the more I deflect, the higher my moment's going to be. So we have to hope that it actually converges upon a specific answer. How do we figure out that deflection? Well, we're going to start talking about it today when we talk about strains. So it's nice because you won't typically see deflections or second order effects a lot in your introduction to structural design but it's going to sneak its way in fourth year and you guys won't like it. So I just want to give you guys some context why we're concerned about strain, why we're concerned about deflection when it comes to structural design. So let's jump into it. Again, this is continuum mechanics. It's not structural design. So we're going to focus more on the simulation aspect of it. So as we're going to see, not only in strain but stress and everything else, a lot of continuum mechanics can be defined using a potato. This is my concept of just a deformable body. It could be anything I want. So if I want to take this potato and I want to simulate it in 3D space, what I'm actually going to do is define the potato using a finite number of points. We call these material points. And if I have all these points, well then I have my potato. Does that make sense? I can define the shape using a collection of points. Now, right now, this means nothing to us. I talked about it a little bit in the seminar on Tuesday. If I were to ask you guys, where is this table? Where is it? Where is this table? Who can tell me where this table is? Such a simple question. Who can describe it using words instead of pointing to it? It's in this room. That's a valid answer. But you see, when we're talking about where something is, we need to relate it to something. You had to say the table was in the room. You could say that the table is at the center of the room. But we always need to relate something to something. This right here is meaningless until we define a coordinate system. Because now we can actually define where our points are located in space. Does that make sense to you guys? Perfect. So what we do with these points is they're coordinate points, but they're actually vectors relating from the origin to these points. And these vectors are denoted by big X. These big X here is basically our initial points, where our object is before we start doing any sort of information. So if we had vector X1, 
we can write it as an expansion of our basis, just like before. So this x1 here is going to be some component times e1, some component times e2, plus some component times e3. This is why we did that linear algebra review. Now this system here, I'm always going to define it as omega naught. And we call this our reference configuration. Again, this is going to be the point before we apply any sort of deformation to the points. So is there any questions so far? We're going to try and go nice and slow, and, but not slow enough to make you fall asleep, but just enough to keep you awake. So this is what we have. We have a potato. It has a lot of points on it. And if we were to look at one of the points, we can define it using a vector big X. That's what we have so far. This big X is its initial point before any deformation. Now, if I were to take my potato, stretch it, compress it, do something to it, we know that it's now going to move. And what we do is we say that we are going from our reference configuration, defined as omega naught, over to our deformed configuration. And this is done using a linear map F. And that's why we talk about tensors. The linear map F is typically actually going to be our stress tensor. We take a potato, we put some stress on it, and we're going to deform it. Okay, That's what we're doing here. Now the question becomes, what happens to this point after I deform it? There's two things that we can do to try and quantify this point over here. The first one is I can create a vector right from our origin over to our new point, And we call this over here small x, this new vector small x. And of course, it's going to be a function of our original vector. And it makes sense, right? Our deformed point is going to be a function of where it initially started. Now, this right here is called a position function. So if I'm relating my deformed point to the origin, like I'm doing here, it's called a position function. Now, it's important because in this course, we're going to assume that this linear map is three things. The first one is bijective. What does that mean to us? We talked about it a lot. Invertible. What does that mean? Well, if I know my deformed state, if I wanted to, I can jump back over to my initial state. That's what it means by invertible. The second two are continuous and smooth. Now think back to your math nightmares. When I say something is continuous and smooth, what is that going to be kind of a hint that we're going to be doing? I hear someone whisper it. They're just scared to say it. Derivatives. Because what we're going to be doing is we're going to see the change in this point with respect to its initial point. Because the point just doesn't jump from here to here. It goes from here to here to here to here to here. It creates a path. And that path has to be differential. Now, realistically, do you think that things are going to be smooth and continuous? No. Best example is think of concrete. It's happy, it's happy, boom, it explodes. After that explosion, it's not very continuous anymore. But in this course, we're going to ignore that, and we're going to say for the beginning, everything is continuous and smooth. Make it nice and simple. It's called linear elasticity. So this is going to be our position function. Have I lost anybody yet? No? Guys are still happy? Perfect. We have a second function called a displacement function. We have position function, but we also have something called a displacement function. So rather than relating this point back to its original origin over here, I can also define this point in reference to where it began. So again, the key here is we have two different types of functions. A position function, which relates our deformed point to our coordinate system, and then we have a displacement function, which relates our deformed point to its initial location. Does that make sense to you guys? Hopefully. Now, question for the math nerds, what did I create here? What did I create? What sort of shape? I create triangle. 
Now, are the sides of a triangle related to each other? Yes. So it turns out there's a very nice relationship between these three components. And that is this. My displacement function is simply going to be my position function subtracted from its initial point. Now here's going to be the key here. When it comes to assignment three, there's only one error students always make, or not really an error, but one question that comes up. What is big X? Big X will always just be a vector of X1, X2, and X3. I'm going to show you guys that later, but all I want to tell you guys right now is this big X is already known. So what's going to happen when we start talking about the different types of questions we can deal with in this class, they're going to focus on displacement functions as well as position functions. In one scenario, I will give you a position function and ask for the displacement function, and in another scenario, I will reverse it. Now, this is going to be important because both of these two functions serve very specific purposes. This position function here, small x, it gives us a lot of information whether our deformation is physically possible. All right? So if I were to ask you guys, is this deformation physically possible? You guys are going to small x. The second thing that you guys may have guessed is strains. That's the whole topic today. If we're concerned about strains, we look at the displacement function u. All right, so we have two different functions. Now, we're going to talk about rigid body displacements before we get into the fun. If I move something as a rigid body displacement, it means I'm translating or rotating. Am I inducing any strains? Who thinks yes? Who thinks no? Yes. So if I were to take my clicker and just move it around, I'm not straining. So I'm not compressing in it or compressing it. I'm not pulling it. I'm just moving it around. So the first type of motion we're going to talk about are these rigid body displacements. And the first one is simply rigid body displacement. And its position function is characterized by x, which again we know. It's just going to be x1, x2, x3 all the time, plus a constant value c. So the first thing to keep in mind is this right here is vector addition. This is a vector, this is a vector, and this is a vector. So all we're doing, if we were to look at this mathematically, is we're taking its initial point where it starts, and we're just moving it by a constant distance. That's all we're doing. So if we were to find our displacement function u, it's going to be small x minus big x, of course. Well, if this is small x, big x minus big x is nothing. We just left with c. Now, physically, what this represents, if we were to have a shape, is us just taking the shape and moving it. It could be in any direction. But again, the key here, the shape did not deform. There's no strains induced on the shape. It's still a perfect square. The second one is rigid body rotation. You guys have actually dealt with this a lot. The, this, oh, sorry, the position function for this is defined by Q times X. You guys remember Q? A rotation matrix. It's going to be the exact same thing here. So Q is going to be our rotation matrix. Again, exact same thing that we had before. And if we were to find our displacement function, it's going to be x minus big x. Well, we know small x is this. We get this right here. And if we were to take our shape and see what it physically represents, it's just going to be a rotation. Again, the key here, no strings are induced on our shape. After that, we have rigid body motion. And this is just a combination of rotation as well as displacement. So rather than just displacing or rotating, I can do a combination of both. So the formula is going to be qx plus c, find our displacement function, and again, it's just going to be a combination of 1 and 2. Now, the last thing I want to emphasize again, because I want you guys to really know this, the distance between the points remains the same. And that's going to be very critical when we start talking about strain. How do we define strain? Well, we look at those material points that we discussed, and we see how they change relative to one another. If I have two points in my initial configuration, and I were to do some sort of rigid body motion, 
Is the distance between those two points going to change? No, because if I were to change them, it means I'm straining my object. The points are going to move together, but the distance between them will always be the same. That's rigid body rotation and displacement. Now, we can look at expansion and contraction. And to do this, we look at three parameters, K1, K2, and K3. Now, these are actually going to be the diagonal components of our displacement. So again, every time I said big X, this is what big X will always be to you guys. It's just going to be X1, X2, and X3. We always know it. If I want uniform extension and contraction, all I'm going to do is take this X and multiply it by this matrix here, or again, K1, K2, and K3. These are going to be my coefficients of expansion or contraction in each direction. So K1 would be along the X axis, K2 would be along the Y axis, and K3 would be along the Z axis. So I can find out my uh, displacement function here. And if I were to look at this, what's basically going to happen, depending on my values of k, is I can start transforming my shape. So if this was in two dimensions, so we ignore kind of the third one here, and I were to have k2 and k1 greater than 1, well, it's going to expand both horizontally and vertically. If I were to take k1 and start playing with it, let's say I take it and set it equal to 1, well, as you can see, now there is no change in shape in terms of the horizontal direction. If I were to take K1 and have it greater than 0 but less than 1, now we start getting contraction. Now what happens when I have it less than 1, or less than 0? Don't really care, yes, because it's not physically possible. What it means is the object starts to invert upon itself. And it's hard to really describe it, but it's the same as me saying, this is my point under the table, and under this, the point would somehow come through the table. We know that it can't go through the table, it's going to make contact. That's why it's not physically possible. This point here went right through the object over to the other side. So we have three scenarios. We have contraction, where k is between 0 and 1, expansion, where k is greater than 1, and then no change in length for k is equal to 1. All right? Not too bad so far, I'm hoping. So let's talk about shear. We just talked about how we expand things in each direction. What about how we shear things? Expansion and contraction are always simple. When it comes to design, this is what you're worried about. Who's taken design classes? I always forget, but it's not a lot of you, which I'm surprised about. I thought a lot of you guys would have taken why is shear so scary to us? Who knows why shear is your worst nightmare? Who wants to take a guess? No one? All right. It's because it's very sudden. It's very quick. If this roof right now were to fail in shear, and I don't want to scare you guys, but if it were, we'd all be dead. Because it would take less than half a second for that roof to be on top of us. It very famously happened in a kind of a, you know those bridges that cross over the top of highways, like the ones going over the white mud? One of those fell onto a, one of the freeways in Quebec. The cars underneath it didn't even have enough time. Flattened. Shear is very scary because it gives us no warning time to get out. That's why we always design things to fail by moment. If this roof were to fail by a moment right now, it would slowly start coming down. It gives us, the user, a lot of time to get out. So when we design things, we not only have to design for it to withstand the stresses, but we have to design for it to, in the worst case where it can't, does it give us warning time to get out? So that's why we design by moment. So we're talking about shear. We have two scenarios we're going to look at. Simple shear, and this is basically this right here, where we're only putting shear on one side. So these are all the same, so it's not going to expand in any direction. But now in this component here, we have a kind of a shear term. What makes it special is if we look at x1, so this is the kind of along the horizontal axis, it's now a function 
of the vertical axis. They start to become coupled together. Now I know I'm losing you guys, so what does this mean? Well, if I were to take my shape here and shear it, it's going to start looking something like this. All right, so here's the key here. If we look at our displacement function, that horizontal component is now a function of x2. And that makes sense. If we were to look at simply the original position along the e2 axis, at this location it's zero, but at the same location of x up top, we can now see that it has displaced a bit. And the further up we go, the more it's going to displace. So that's going to be shear. Well, pure shear. Simple shear, or sorry, pure shear, which is the opposite, not the opposite, but kind of a modification, is now where we have shear on both sides. So if we were to look at what this looks like, it's going to start shearing both this side as well as that side. So does that make sense what shear looks like? I don't really care about you guys trying to calculate these. I'm more concerned that you guys just know what shear looks like. Where we start shearing our object. Again, very scary for us because it happens very quickly in real life. Now we're going to talk about strain. And this is where it starts to get a lot of fun for everybody. This diagram we described above, we are going to modify it to get strain. Now we're going to derive what we call the green and small strain tensors. It's going to look like ass. But don't worry, I will never test you on derivation. I'm just going to test you on the final product. So this diagram here we talked about, is there any questions concerning this? Because if you guys don't understand this, then strain's going to start going out the window. You guys are happy? Perfect. So to derive the strain tensors, we consider another point on our object. Again, we characterize strain by the change in length between two points. So on our initial configuration, we're going to say that it's originally dx. And then in our reference configuration, as we can see, it's a little bit longer. We have the smaller. So these are not the same. And the strain can be characterized by the change in length of dx from the small x. So that's going to be our whole goal. We need to derive a relationship between this and this. Well, before we do that, we can actually create another vector, which is another displacement uh, function, and it's going to be x plus dx. That's it. So what we're going to do is we're going to utilize vector addition, back all the way to end 130 vector addition. What we want to do is we want to go from this point over here, point O, and we want to end up at point P. That's our whole goal. How do we do this? Well, all you guys have to do is just find the path. That's all you guys have to do. It's like one of those mazes. That's all you have to do. So if I want to, I can go from O up to this point, then up again, and then across over to point P. So my path would have been I go x plus dx plus u of x plus dx. Any questions about path number one? No? You guys look confused? That's OK. Section one, we can go all the way to small x to here, and then simply out by dx. Path number two. Will these two paths be the same? What do you guys think? Who thinks yes? All right, who thinks no? No one thinks no. Yes, they're going to be the same. So what we're going to do is we can take these two paths and simply just equate them together. So we get this formula over here. This is where all of our kind of derivation takes place. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to say I have a small x and I have a big X. Is there a relationship with small x, big x, and u? Yes. So I'm going to try and get that. I'm going to take the small x, and I'm going to throw it over to the other side. Now I get minus, and then x minus big x. What is this equal to? u. Exactly. This right here is equal to u. So we get this right here, where u is a function of x. It's not u times x, it's just a function of x. 
Now, this is something I don't expect you guys to know, but this term right here, well, actually, I'll ask you guys, does anyone know what this is right here? This is the definition of a gradient. What is a gradient? Well, it's basically the derivatives of a vector, how a vector changes as it goes through. So we're going to take this term right here, and we're going to say, all right, this is now going to be what we call the gradient of the displacement function. And I'm going to call it nabla u. So this upside down triangle is called nabla, and then we have u. So nabla u, the gradient. We haven't discussed what this is, but I'm going to show you guys in the next slide. So now we're at this right here. Again, these are all vectors, and this nabla u is actually going to be a tensor or a matrix. From here, I'm going to say, all right, I have dx kind of on both terms. So if this was just regular algebra and I had x on both sides, could I factor it out? Yes. So I'm going to factor out this dx. Now, for matrices, vectors, it's a little bit different. We have to deal with the identity tensor, but it's not so bad we get this. Again, I just factored out dx. So now we got i plus nabla u times dx is equal to d small x. And I'm going to introduce one more thing, which I know you guys already hate me for doing nabla u, but I'm going to do one more, and that is this, f. And f right here is going to be i plus nabla u. We call this right here the deformation gradient. And we're going to discuss it again on the next slide. This right here allows us to conclude this nice piece of information right here doesn't look like much, and this is not our final product. But this right here is how we derive strength, this formula right here. Now, before we go to the next slide and I define what nabla u and f is, again, I want to just show you guys kind of the core. These two right here are gradients. They're basically the derivative of vectors, how my vector changes when I load it. Nabla u is how my displacement position changes. Right? Nabla u is how my displacement function changes. F over here is how my position function changes. So as we're going to see, f is going to be a function of small x, and nabla u is going to be a function of u. But they're going to be the exact same formula. The only difference is one goes for x, the other one goes over to u. So let's discuss them real quick. The deformation and the displacement gradients. Again, the deformation gradient, that's going to be f. The displacement gradient, that's going to be nabla u. I'm going to show you guys what they look like, and don't get scared. It's going to be bad, but it's not too bad if we actually look what's going on. Our displacement gradient, nabla u, is a vector value, or sorry, is the gradient of our vector value function u. So it's going to be a tensor field. They're basically for us, in our purposes, a matrix. What matrix is it going to be? Well, it's going to be this. It's going to be the partial derivative of ui with respect to xj. This doesn't look like much, but this actually utilizes something called Einstein notation. So although it's not shown explicitly, this is actually the summation from i comma j equals 1 to 3 of this. What does that mean? Well, it means it's this. And this is where people start not liking continual mechanics, <laughs> at this point right here. It doesn't look very pretty. Who's excited to see this? No one. Who's not excited to see this? Who's waiting for Yong to come busting through all excited? This is not nice. When I saw this, I thought, okay, I'm going home. See you later. Son. But I realized that this actually isn't that bad because it's sequential. There's a nice pattern inside of it. And that is this. All the rows always reference one function. When we deal with position and displacement functions, there's always going to be three. One that describes the horizontal motion, one describes the horizontal motion in the other direction, and one describes the vertical motion. U1, U2, U3. And all we're doing is we're taking those functions that we have, and we're just taking the partial derivatives with respect to x1, the next two, and the next two. Again, the first row is always going to be u1 every single time. And we're just taking it with respect to big X1, big X2, big X3. 
If we go on to the second row, it's the same thing. x1, x2, x3, but now we're always dealing with u2. And finally, for the third one, we have u3. Now, who was in the seminar on Tuesday? Was this that bad to calculate? They're, they're shaking their head no. Trust me. <laughs> Trust me. It looks bad, but it's actually not that bad. And we're going to do examples to show you guys how easy this is. When it comes to the midterm, and I would to give you guys something like this, it is easier to do it by hand than to use Mathematica. I will show you guys Mathematica, but trust me, it's actually easier to do by hand because it's that simple. And the reason why is because these functions for this class, for, for kind of the mid portion of this class, they're not going to be higher than x squared. Can you guys take the derivative of x squared? How about the derivative of x? You guys will be fine. There's going to be nothing crazy. So this is going to be our displacement gradient, now the u. Again, the key thing here is it uses our displacement functions, u1, u2, and u3. The deformation gradient, which we call f, is actually going to be the exact same because, again, it's a gradient. This is the definition of a gradient. But now instead of u, it's going to be a function of x. So we have a relationship between u and small x, and we can use it to get this identity here. So we get this. But then it turns out that f is actually just going to be the same gradient, but instead of u1, u2, and u3, we now have small x1, small x2, small x3. So you guys are going to get a lot of practice with this when it comes to your assignments. Your assignment this week is going to give you one of two things. It's either going to give you uh, u1, u2, u3, or it's going to give you x1, x2, and x3. And it'll ask you, what is the displacement gradient? What is the deformation gradient? Well, if I'm given small x, I can find f just by taking partial derivatives, and then I can transfer over to Navel u by the nice relationship, and vice versa. If I give you guys displacement functions, you guys can go over here, find Navel u, and then find f using this nice relationship. And that's all the assignment is this week. It's basically making sure you guys understand the deformation and the displacement gradient. But now we're getting off track. Why did we need these two things to find? What are we still trying to define? Strain. We haven't defined strain yet. When it came to strain, we were left with this formula here. I had it boxed because it's important, but that's not the one you guys need to know. We are going to take this formula and we are going to modify it to get our strain tensors. This formula right here is actually very nice. So again, my whole goal here is I want to find the change in length between two points. If I have a vector, what is its length? The norm. So what we're going to do here is we're going to start taking the norm of things. Again, I want to relate how does my uh, deformed length or, uh, relate to my original length. And to do this, we want to find a relationship using the norms of dx and d small x. So what we're going to do is we are going to dot each equation by itself. It looks kind of weird in vector form, but basically I'm taking my equation and I'm just squaring both sides. That's all I'm technically doing. So we're going to get this. dx dot dx is equal to fdx dot fdx. And this is what you guys are going to have to do for the bonus question in your assignment that's coming. So we got this relationship here. Now, what is the vector dotted with itself? Who remembers? The norm squared. Exactly. So this right here is actually dx squared. Another nice property about the dot product that we don't discuss because we only really use it here is I can take f and push it over here to say dx dot with f transpose f dx. This is a dot product property, but you guys don't really need to know it. Again, I'm not testing you guys on derivation. So now we're left with this over here. This side looks pretty good, but this side looks kind of gross. So what we're going to do is we're going to define this right here, f transpose f, 
as the right Hoshi green deformation tensor. That's no fun to say. Hoshi, as you guys will see, was a genius. He helped derive the strain tensor, and when we look at the stress tensor, the stress tensor is actually called the Cauchy stress tensor. This guy was kind of the father of continuum mechanics in that regard. But all we did is we defined it as C. Now let's look at C. Remember, C is going to be right here. If I have C equal to the identity matrix, okay, I'm saying if, I'm not saying it is. If it was, I get this formula right here. dx squared, same thing, and then we get dx dotted with i dx, well that's just dx squared. We have no strain. So this is going to be the key here. If this tensor is equal to the identity matrix, the lengths do not change. It's just rigid body motion. Okay? But is it equal to the identity tensor? No. I can take F transpose of F, and I can kind of expand it out using the relationship between F and the displacement gradient here, and then I get this formula right here. So this right here is where all of the strain comes from right here. First things first, what is I basically resulting if it was just I? No? No? Rigid body motion. So this I right here ensures that rigid body motion is possible. That's what it does. That's its purpose. If this ensures rigid body motion, again, from above, then these parameters right here, these are the ones that are going to contribute to strain. So again, if it was just I, our length does not change, there's no strain. Therefore, it must be these components right here that lead to changes in length or strains. That's the key. These parts right here. Nav U plus Nav U transpose plus Nav U transpose Nav U. All right, there's, there's the key. So when we look at this, we can now redefine our right Cauchy green deformation tensor as this. For C is equal to I plus 2 multiplied by what we call the green strain tensor, where our green strain tensor is 1 half of Nav U plus Nav U transpose plus Nav U transpose Nav U. This is kind of the first big piece of information. I had it written at the very top. The focus of today's lecture is the small strain tensor and the green strain tensor. Here's the green strain tensor. 1 half Nav U plus Nav U transpose plus Nav U transpose Nav U. We discussed before that Nav U is just a bunch of derivatives, so we can easily find it. So if I know Nav U, can I figure out my green strain tensor? Yes? No? Maybe? Yes. So it's actually not too bad. We can also write it into component form as follows. Uh, the reason why I have this in here is because I use these uh, set of slides for the graduate course. You guys won't need to know this in this course. This is for the graduate kids. It's, it's their treat. So don't worry about this. Just focus on this right here. So we've derived one of the two strain tensors. Was this difficult? Was it, who thinks it's pretty bad? Who thinks it's not too bad? Perfect. Because if you guys understand the green strain tensor, the small strain tensor is going to be a piece of tape. So real quick, the green strain tensor, it's symmetric, and it's going to be valid for finite deformations. What does this mean, finite? What's this basically saying? It converges. converges. It's basically valid for large deformations. We said that we have two strain tensors. One's kind of the general strain tensor, and the other one is specifically for small deformations. That's the small strain tensor, if you guys can get it. This one right here, this is the big boy. The big kahuna. It's valid for anything. But do we want to calculate this? No. As we're going to see, this is easy. This is easy. This is not so much fun. No one wants to do this part right here. So let's talk about this part at the end. So also with the green strain tensor, we have a small, or sometimes called the infinitesimal strain tensor. And what we do is we say, all right, well, our green strain tensor is valid for basically large deformations. 
But I'm a structural engineer. I don't care about large deformations. I care about small deformations. The roof above you. How much has it deflected since you guys have been coming to school here? Two millimeters? Look at the span. What would you guys say that is? Like 30 meters? So two millimeters relative to 30 meters, it's nothing. So what we can do is we can say, all right, this is valid for everything. But if we're dealing with very small deformations and very small strains, it turns out that this component right here is much smaller than these components. So what ends up happening is that even if you calculate it for small deformations, the strain tensor is going to be exactly the same. So what we do for the small strain tensor, it's very simple, we just ignore this component. Again, for small deformations, this component is very, very small. So what we can do is we can say our green strain tensor is approximately equal to this plus this plus zero because we're ignoring this. And this leads us to our small strain tensor, which is one half of NABLA U plus NABLA U transpose. Now, this is a fun strain tensor because it leads to some very good questions. Under rigid body rotation, right, rigid body rotation, if I were to take my clicker and just rotate it, am I straining it? This thing will tell me that I am, even though we know that it's not. So this does have limitations. Again, the small deformations. So one of the best questions that usually you get on an exam is rigid body rotation. I ask for the strain. Everybody assumes it's zero, rigid body rotation. But if you were to calculate it using this, it's actually not zero. Now, question for you guys. If I were to just rotate this again, but I were to calculate strain using the green strain tensor, will it pick up strains? What do you guys think? No. So if you guys were to actually calculate it using this formula, it'll be correct in that, no, there is no strains. This one has limitations of small deformation. All right? So that's kind of, kind of the gist here. Uh, we can also write this into component form, but you guys don't really need to know about component form. And I think that's it. Oh, symmetric, valid for small deformations. Again, the nice thing is everything that we deal with is symmetric. So if my strain tensor was a 3 by 3 matrix, how many unknown components will there be? 3 by 3 matrix. How many unknown components? Who thinks 9? Who thinks 6? It's 6 because it's symmetric. All right, so that's it. We are going to go tackle what everybody wants to tackle, and that is going to be the deformation and displacement gradients. Again, it looks really bad, but after we go through this, I think you guys will be pleasantly surprised. So it says in this question, actually, I, I'm jumping the gun. Is there any questions concerning the strain tensors? No? Again, all we need to do is find that displacement gradient, and then we can easily calculate our strain tensors every single time. All right, if there's no questions, then I'll jump back into this. So it says, for each position function, determine the deformation gradient. What is that called? Or what variable do we use for the deformation gradient? Who remembers? Who thinks it's F? Who thinks it's Nabla U? No one answered. <laughs> this one's F. The displacement gradient, this is Nabla U. The next question it says, is the deformation physically possible? And then it says, is the deformation an expansion, contraction, or volume preservation? This is something I forgot to tell you guys in the slides, but I'll show you guys here. Is the deformation physically possible? It's actually very simple to determine. We use the determinants. So what we're going to do is we're going to come down and say, OK, this is x. We have basically our position functions. So when you guys see this vector, keep in mind that this is actually going to be three position functions. The first row is x1. The second row is x2. And then the third row 
is X3, which is great because when we looked at that deformation tensor, the first row always had X1, the second row always had X2, and the third row always had X3. So we can see here that we're actually given X1, X2, and X3. So if I were to scroll down and say, all right, well, I know that my deformation tensor, F, is going to be a 3 by 3 matrix, and it's going to be a bunch of partial derivatives. So the first one would be partial derivative of X1 with respect to big X1. The second one would be partial derivative of X1 again, but now with respect to X2. And then it's going to be the partial derivative of X1 again with respect to X3. The second and the third rows are going to be the exact same, but instead of X1, 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 it's going to be X2, X2, X2. So that's all we're basically going to be doing. So I'm not going to write it because that would just take too much time. So I'm just going to leave it here. I'll go dot, 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 dot. So again, it looks bad. No one sees this and is happy. But it actually isn't too bad because we're going to go through it together. The first row is always small x1. I hope you guys can see that. So let's go to the highlighter. We have x1, x1, and x1. First row is always x1, small x1. So for the first row, all we're doing is we are going to look at this function right here, because that's what our x1 is. Does that make sense to you guys? First row always deals with small x1, so all we need to do is look at small x1. And then all we need to do is take the derivatives of it. So I'm going to come down right here, and I'm just going to write it down. x1, we're given as 0 0.8 times big x1, plus 0 0.2 x2, and then plus 0 0.01 x3. So this is my function. And all I'm going to do is take the partial derivatives of it with respect to big X1, big X2, big X3. So I'm just going to scroll down. We said our first component is going to be the partial derivative of X1 with respect to big X1. Now, for the partial derivatives, it doesn't look nice, but it's actually really simple. If I'm taking the partial derivative of, let's say, x2 with respect to x1, so the x's are not the same, what's it going to be? Zero. So that's all you guys need to do. I'm going to look right here and say, okay, I'm taking it with respect to x1. So my only non-zero terms are going to be the terms in small x that have an x1. If I were to go across, I only have one term that has x1. Now, you guys actually don't have to think of it this way, because all you guys really need to do is just go across. And I'll do this in different colors. So I say, all right, my first term is 0.8x1. What is the derivative of 0.8x1 with respect to x1? 0 0.8. So you say, all right. This is equal to 0 0.8. And say, okay, well, that's the first term. Let's switch. What right about the second term? 0 0.2x2 with respect to x1. Zero, because there's no x1. I can't take the derivative of x2 with respect to x1. You basically treat it like a constant. So this is going to be plus zero. Moving on to the next one, 0.01x3 with respect to x1. What's this going to be? Zero, because again, I don't have an x1. So plus zero. And as we can see, this is just going to be equal to 0 0.8. So it looks really intimidating, but as we can see, you guys can just fly through this no problem. If I wanted to take partial derivative of x1 now with respect to big x2, and I'll just switch to green, 
what's going to be my first turn? Just going through it. Starting with the green. Zero. I'm taking the derivative of x1, now with respect to x2, well that's just going to be equal to zero. And I should erase this first. All right, how about the orange term? How about the orange term? This term right here, when I take that with respect to x2. Who thinks it's zero? Who thinks it's 0 0.2? Zach, if you guys know it, why aren't you saying it? I look like a fool in these online videos. <laughs> That's 0 0.2. And then the blue term? Oops. 0 0.01? Zero. zero. See, you guys got it. So let me just ask you guys really quick. What is the partial derivative of x1? So I'll write it kind of right here. With respect to x3. Zero point zero one. Because again, this is going to be zero, this is going to be zero, and this is going to be zero point zero one. So how are you guys finding these? What do you guys think? Good? Bad? Who's waiting for the Mathematica code? The nice thing is, this is as crazy as it will basically get in this course. I might give you guys quadratic, but anything above that's just me. And anything that would be above that, I would just make you guys do it in Mathematica. Mathematica, we can do this very fast. So what I'm going to do is say, okay, you guys know exactly what it is. I'm going to erase this table here. And we are going to go together and just write in all the entries. Because you guys are experts now. You guys gave me the thumbs up. We'll see if you regret that. All right. So we said that the first one is 0 0.8, 0 0.2, and 0 0.01. So we got 0 0.8, 0 0.2, and then we have 0 0.01. So that was for the first row. The second row is going to be the same process, but now we're looking at x2. So looking at x2 right here, the first component is going to be x2 differentiated with respect to big X1. What's that going to be? 0 0.01. Exactly. 0 0.01. How about when I take it with respect to X2? 0 0.9. How about when I take it with respect to X3? 0. What about for now small x3? I'm just going to erase this. Oops, highlight this. What's the first component going to be? Zero, because I'm taking it with respect to x1. How about the second component? Zero. And the third one? 1.4. So as you can see, that was much quicker than having to type it all into Mathematica. Turns out to be really nice. That's the one thing I love about teaching courses like this is that on paper, you look so smart, so big brain. But then you, it's just 0 0.8, 0 0.1, all the way through. So I'm going to get rid of this. Because once you guys have one of the gradients, to go to the other gradient is very simple. We either add or subtract the identity matrix. So if I have this right here, Turns out that NABLU, my displacement gradient, is just going to be F minus I. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to try and copy all this. Oh, I'll go. I guess I didn't need the F there. Oops. How do I copy? Did I click? Nope. <laughs> Who knows how to copy on iPad? I'm having like a senior moment. Did I click? No? Okay, okay. Who cares? <laughs> I'm not I make myself look like a fool in these videos. <laughs> Turns out I don't need your help. <laughs> Alright. So if I'm subtracting the identity matrix, is every entry going to be impacted? 
if I'm subtracting i? No. Which ones are going to be impacted? Just the diagonals. And all I'm doing is I'm subtracting one from each one. So all I would do is say, all right, we got 0 0.8 minus 1. Uh, that should be negative 0 0.2. We got 0 0.2 because that doesn't change. 0 0.01. This 0 0.01 doesn't change either. Uh, 0 0.9 minus 1. Really? <laughs> 0 0.1. This is 0, 0, 0, 0 0.4. So hopefully this makes sense to you guys. But it leads me to one of my key points. We have now figured out numerically in an example F and W. Are they symmetric? Who thinks yes? Who thinks no? So this is kind of the key thing. Students start to expect that everything in this course becomes symmetric. Most of it will. Strain tensor, as we saw, it's going to be symmetric. The stress tensor will be symmetric. The constitutive laws will be symmetric. But these two right here, they don't have to be symmetric. I want you to let you guys know that. It's a good example. Yes? A row of all zeros. Yep. So like this one right here could be all zeros. And that's basically, if I were to take this in three dimensions and just, did it go vertical? Do that. So it's basically, if you have a row of all zeros, it's just ignoring whatever direction that is. Everything takes place in one way. For example, and this is a, that's actually such a great question, if we were to look at this right here, if it was just two-dimensional movement, we would just write it as a two-by-two two matrix. But all of our 2D scenarios, we can still write them in 3D, just everything will be zeros. Make sense? Perfect. All right, uh, moving on. So the next question is if the deformation is physically possible. And this goes back to this. And actually, I should have answered your question. So one of the things, too, is there are restrictions on the amount of zeros we can have in this. The displacement gradient, if that's zeros, that's what I showed you. It's just moving not in one direction. The deformation gradient actually plays a big role. And this is where I want to introduce it. When we calculate the strain, do we need both of these for the strain tensor? You guys remember the formula for the strain tensor? I already forgot it. Wonderful. The strain tensor just needs this. It's one half of NABLE U plus NABLE U transpose. So the question becomes, Clayton, what do we do this for? This right here helps us to determine if things are physically possible. That's the key here. If you guys ever have a question, is it physically possible? You guys are looking at F. And what you guys want for physically possible, right, right here, the determinant of F has to be greater than zero. This can all be deduced from the slides where we start talking about expansion and contraction. If this is greater than zero, this is physically possible. If it's equal to zero, it's not physically possible. And if it's less than zero, it's also not physically possible. So in this course, we always want our determinants of our deformation gradients to be greater than zero. And the reason why is this. It's actually quite simple. The determinant of F is actually equal to something called the Jacobian, J. And this Jacobian is the ratio of the volume of our shape after it's been deformed compared to its initial volume. So its initial volume, if I have a shape here, it'll always be greater than zero. Does that make sense? Everything has volume. If I were to look at this formula, which again is equal to my determinant of f, and let's say that this was equal to zero. What does this say happens to the volume of my shape after I deformed it? 
It's zero. Can something physically have volume and then just disappear? Not a magician. The answer is no. I can't just say, okay, here's my table. I'm going to put some stress on it and poof, it goes away. It doesn't quite happen that way. Now, if I were to have this and I were to get it less than zero, what does this mean happened to the volume of my shape? Somehow became negative. Can we have a negative volume? No. So this is why we want it to be greater than zero. But then it comes to two different things. We're going to again look at this. So let's say it was greater than zero. Let's say it's equal to one. What happens to the volume of my shape? Stayed the same. What happens if it turned into, let's say, 1.5? Volume got bigger, expanded. And if it was 0 0.5, got smaller. So whenever you guys think of physically possible, go to this Jacobian. Again, it's just the kind of the ratio of volumes. And you can easily tell what it has to be to be physically possible. Hopefully that makes sense to you guys. So it turns out in this particular question, if we were to go up, because we now have F, we have everything that we need. If I were to do the determinant, I get my determinant of F to be equal to 1.0052. Is this physically possible? Who thinks yes? Who thinks no? It's yes, because it's greater than zero. Now, the second part is this expansion or contraction. Expansion. Not a lot of expansion, but it's still expanded. And the reason why we have such a small number is because I don't want you guys to get used to things like two. Could you imagine if I were to just pull this and it exploded by a factor of two? Typically, our expansions are very small. Things are rigid. They don't deform easily. So that would be pretty realistic. Let's go on to the next one. And this one's a fun one. We're going to say that our position function, x, is qx, where q is equal to this. Now, does this look familiar? Yes. What is this matrix? Counterclockwise rotation. Is this the same as our 2 by 2 matrices that we did? Could I have, in theory, when we went to our 2 by 2 matrices, could, have I, could I have used this one and just had 0 for the y3 values, or I guess z components? Yes. So we can express 2D things in 3D. We just have to add ones accordingly. But if we were to look at this, and this is just rotation, and we have this formula here, what is this type of motion? Let's put this way. Should I expect strains? No, I should not expect strains. So we say, okay, and this one's kind of fun. This will give you guys a little bit of a bit of a trick. So we say, all right, if I were to expand X out, because we know that X is simply going to be that matrix Q multiplied by big X. I get, actually, I'll write that down because this is something that you guys should never forget. Whenever you guys have big X, it's always just going to be equal to big X1, big X2, big X3. Because again, it's just the initial point. It always looks like it's an unknown, but it's actually always just going to be big X1, big X2, big X3. So if I were to say, all right, X, which is just equal to Q multiplied by X, I get this right here. I get cosine of theta times x1, I get sine of theta times x2, I get 0, I get negative sine of theta times x1, I get cosine of theta times x2, 0, 0, 0, and I get x3. You guys can throw that into Mathematica if you guys want. So this is our position function. We now have small x1, small x2, small x3, just written in kind of a matrix form. If I were to now say, okay, I want my deformation gradients, 
I guess these would be added together. If I want my deformation gradient f, so again these are just kind of added together, and all we're doing is taking partial derivatives of each one of those rows. Again, the first one we're going to be referencing the first row. What is going to be my first component? Again, the differential of this with respect to x1. Cosine theta. That's going to be my second component. Sine theta. And then the last one, of course, will be 0. Down here, I get negative sine theta. Cosine of theta. 0, 0, 0, 1. So this is kind of the fun trick. Did you guys already see this matrix? Yes. If I were to scroll up, F is the same as Q. So here's the fun fact, the little trick. If you ever did your position function as some matrix multiplied by big X, well then F will always be whatever you multiply it by. Because all we're doing is we're adding x1, x2, x3, but then we're differentiating with respect, as long as this is constant. So in rigid body rotation and motion, it was always constant. So when we multiply it by x, while we create linear variables, then we differentiate, we go back to the constants. So this is kind of a little fun. Q turned out to be the same as f. Not too bad. Now, one of the fun things is Q is orthogonal, right? You guys remember that? Q is orthogonal. What's the determinant of Q? If it's a rotation. So if it's always rotation and it's orthogonal, 1. So we come down here, and we don't know what theta is, but that's no problem, because we know that the determinant of F is equal to 1. So what does this mean? Is it physically possible? But is there expansion or contraction? No. Which goes again with rigid body rotation. I can take something and I can rotate it. I'm not straining it. But here's the fun fact. If you guys were to now take this F, find nabla U, and then find your strains, the small strain tensor will predict strains. That's the fun, the fun of it. And it's actually very easy to see because if I were to go down here, and I wanted nabla u, which is equal to basically f minus the identity. We're going to get cosine of theta minus 1. This is still going to be sine of theta, 0, negative sine of theta, cosine theta minus 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. Now, our strain tensor formula, and we're going to cover this later on. I just want to show this as an example so you, so you guys can see. This is equal to 1 half of nabla u plus nabla u transpose. So what's going to happen if I were to take the original one, let's say sine of theta. Oops, that's the eraser. <laughs> so this is in nabla u. And if I were to transpose it, then this value comes up to the top. So what happens when I go sine plus negative sine? Zero. So what ends up happening is this formula, or I guess my strain tensor, actually turns out to be this. Oops, I want to erase this too. So as we can see, it does predict strains. Now what happens when cosine, or I guess theta, is really, really small? What happens when cosine is, or what happens when theta is 0? Do I get strains when theta is equal to 0? No. So what happens if my rotation is 0 0.0001 degrees? What's this component going to be, big or small? Exactly. So this is, again, the small string tensor. For small rotations and displacements, 
as you can see, it provides a good approximation. What happens when theta is like 70 degrees? It's going to start predicting a lot of strains, both horizontally as well as vertically. But here's the key. If I were to have added plus nabli u transpose nabli u, so the green strain tensor, these would actually become zero. So it's one of those things that when we're using the small strain tensor, we have to realize the limitations of them. But it's, again, very easy to see for small deformations. It's not bad at all. Uh, we'll move on to the next one. This one's kind of fun. X is equal to mx, where m is equal to this. What is that? M. M is constant, so if I were to throw x's in there and then differentiate with respect to x, I just get f is equal to m. And in this particular case, if I were to take the determinant of f, I get it equal to 0 0.792. So my question for you guys really quick, is this expansion or contraction? Contraction, because it's less than 1. Now, the reason why I flew past that one is because I want to go to this one. This one's a lot of fun. So let's figure out what F is really quick. You guys are experts now. You guys will know exactly what to do. The trick isn't finding F. I said this is fun, but not for this reason. If I wanted the first component, again, it's going to reference the first row, what's my first component going to be? I heard 0 0.8. Is that all? Exactly. Plus 0 0.02 x1. What about the second component? If I want this component right here beside it, again, same equation, but now with respect to x2. It's going to be 0 0.04 x2. Because again, this is the only one that has x2 in it. And then our last one, of course, is going to be 0. If I were to go down to the next one, we're going to have 0 0.01. That's easy. X2, easy, 0 0.9. And then we got 0 0.02 X. Oh, I guess I can't write up there. It'd be X3. Last one, 0, 0, and then we got 1.4. Again, the key or the trick to this question isn't so much this. Here's where the fun thing comes in. Is this physically possible? How do we determine if it's physically possible again? The determinant. So you say, okay, I know exactly what to do. There's no tricks here. My determinant of f, and if I were to calculate it, it is equal to 0 0.8 plus 0 0.02 x1 multiplied by 0 0.9, 1.4, and then I guess this would be minus minus 0 0.04 x2, and then 0 0.01, 0 0.4. I'm trying to go fast. I know you guys are ready to go. My point is this. Is that physically possible? Who thinks yes? Who thinks no? The question is we can't tell. Because it's now a function of x1 and x2. It's called non-homogeneous. Basically, the rate of change throughout my body is different in different locations. That makes sense. If we deal with things in structural, and we had a cantilever beam, I'm going to try and draw it out really, really bad. So let's say that there was a load that caused this. Is this bottom here in compression or tension? Compression. It's contracting. Is the top of my beam in compression or tension? Tension. So as we can see, different parts of our body are going to undergo different sort of deformation. Hopefully that makes sense to you all.
All right, that's it, guys. Thank you so much. And let me know if you guys have